Did you know that it's possible to beat the original Pokemon Red in just a little over 60 seconds? Speedrunning is the art of trying to complete a game as fast as humanly possible. But there is a subsection of speedrunners that asks an even more fundamental question. What is the theoretical limit to how fast a game can be beaten? To answer this, people create what is known as a Tool Assisted Speedrun, or TAS. The TAS of Pokemon Red by Mr. Wint, which is playing right here next to my face, takes less time to complete than it takes me to do this ad read. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Have you ever wanted to watch a show on your favorite streaming service but it's not available in your country? A VPN can help you with that. Nord allows you to connect to over 52 different countries to find the ones which have your favorite shows and give you access to the full library that your streaming service has to offer. Additionally, a VPN can protect your data when you're traveling. If you're out at cafes or you're traveling to airports and you're using public Wi-Fi networks, your data isn't secured in those unless you use a VPN. Nord also has a cybersecurity tool now called Nord Threat Protection, which protects you from malware online as well. They have 24-7 customer support and a money-back guarantee if you don't like it. Additionally, though, it is Nord Birthday Month, which means in addition to the huge discount that you get for signing up with my link, you also get three months up to a full year as a present for signing up. What the hell is going on over there? This all looks like a complete mess, but I promise you by the end of this video, it will all make sense. Anyway, thank you to Nord for sponsoring today's video. I really hope you guys enjoy it. Let's find out how this task actually works. A tool-assisted speedrun is not necessarily created in one sitting, but rather crafted as a perfect sequence of events that is strung together and eventually played back as a video. If a traditional speedrun is a live concert, a Taz is a recorded album. In the case of Pokemon Red, the game is played on an emulator called BizHawk. This tool allows players to advance the game frame by frame and adjust their input each time. Additionally, it allows the use of save states. This means the runner can try any input combination for any frame of the game and just rewind if they don't like the result. This is done until they find the sequence that beats the game as fast as they know to be possible. That final sequence is then replayed and recorded to create a Taz. But what does it actually mean to beat Pokemon Red? Finishing the game is defined as initiating the game's credit sequence. This event happens when entering the Hall of Fame at the Indigo Plateau, after beating your rival and champion, Blue. In order to get to this final room, the player has to beat all members of the Elite Four. And in order to enter the Elite Four, all eight gym badges have to be acquired by the player. Mr. Wint will skip all of this by transporting himself from his starting location in Pallet Town into the Hall of Fame. Sequences like the credits are little programs in the game's code known as map scripts. The map script for the credit sequence is initiated by being brought to this spot in the Hall of Fame after defeating Blue. The game can only load map scripts that are part of the map the player is currently on. So in order to load the credit sequence, two things have to happen. The map for the Hall of Fame must be loaded, and the credits map script must be initiated. Mr. Wint will be achieving both of these by manipulating the game's memory. When you play a Game Boy game, every piece of information pertaining to your save file is stored on the console's random access memory, or RAM. For the purposes of this video, think of the RAM as a long list of bytes. Everything from your Pokemon to your items, how many badges you have, where you are on the map, and so on, is stored on this list. This includes information about what map you're currently on, the map ID, and whether or not you're initiating a map script. The runner's goal is to get access to these parts of the RAM and change the bytes corresponding to the map ID and map script to these values. The first part of the setup for this trick happens when you start the intro sequence of the game. At the moment you select new game, the player's trainer ID is generated. The game has a global source of RNG which changes each frame. Because of the tools used by Mr. Wind, he knows exactly when to press the A button for the global RNG to be pulled for the trainer ID when it is a specific necessary value. The ID is found here in the RAM and is manipulated to correspond to this exact value. Look familiar? After the intro sequence, Mr. Wind will be performing the trick needed to break through the barrier that prevents him from accessing the game's deeper data. This is the save corruption glitch. You see, RAM only works when the console is powered on. In order to save the game, the data on the RAM must be copied over to the static random access memory, or SRAM. This memory chip is found on the game's cartridge and is constantly powered by an attached battery. This battery running dry is the reason why the Pokemon Red cartridge in your closet has probably stopped working. Its SRAM is no longer powered and can therefore no longer hold any save data. 
When the console is powered on, it checks for a valid existing save. If you then press continue, it copies all the data from the SRAM over to the RAM. Mr. Wind will now be tricking the system to break the game open. You see, if the cartridge has no previous save data or the save data has been cleared, all bytes on the SRAM are by default set to FF, the hexadecimal equivalent of 255. This is the highest number that can be stored by one byte of data. Normally, this shouldn't be a problem because the SRAM is only read from when there is a save file. However, because the saving process takes place frame by frame and byte by byte, the console can be tricked into thinking that there is a save file if the process is interrupted when enough data has been transferred. Because Mr. Wind can see the memory be transferred frame by frame with BizHawk's memory watch, he can see the exact moment he needs to turn off the console. Right? Here. The SRAM has saved enough data to think there is a full save file, however, at least one crucial byte has not been overwritten and is still set to 255, the byte containing the player's party size. Normally, this number should be between 0 and 6. As the cartridge is booted back up, the game now believes Mr. Wind's party size to be a whopping 255 Pokémon. The barrier blocking access to the rest of the game's RAM has now been broken. Before opening the menu, the player character makes the only movement in the run and takes one step south. This is only done because having a Y position of 1 instead of 0 uncomplicates some of the math done and will save 8 frames of lag, or a little over 1 tenth of a second. Mr. Wint will now begin manipulating data inside the game's RAM. To understand how he does this, we have to understand what it means to swap the position of, for example, Pokémon 1 and Pokémon 2 inside the party. To do this, the memory looks at the addresses of the Pokémon's data, and then does simple math operations to move them around. These math operations take the Pokémon's positions, in this case 1 and 2, into account. So even if a 7th, or an 8th, or a 255th Pokémon doesn't exist, the game's code will still execute the function and do the math using a 7, or an 8, or a 255. The two pieces of memory that we actually want to change are found all the way down here. The map ID's address is where the 22nd Pokémon's data would be. The map script pointer is just one Pokémon down instead of the hypothetical data of Pokémon 23. With this goal in mind, Mr. Wind will start swapping Pokémon in his party to set up the endgame warp. Because the game thinks he has 255 Pokémon, it does not loop his cursor back to the top of the party when pressing down on the 6th Pokémon, and instead allows him to continue scrolling. He starts by swapping the 4th Pokémon with the 13th Pokémon as a preparation swap. What's important to note here is that because of the corrupted memory, the 4th's Pokémon data is still set to all FFs, or 255s. These maxed out bytes are now sent to the 13th Pokémon's data for later use. Next up, Mr. Wind swaps Pokémon number 11 with number 12, which brings all the bytes he needs for the warp, including his previously manipulated trainer ID, into the part of the RAM that holds his items. He then swaps Pokémon 10 and Pokémon 13 to transfer the corrupted FF bytes over to the part of the list that holds his item count. Because his item count is no longer zero, Mr. Wind can open his bag and scroll through it. His goal here is to bring the bytes into the correct spots inside the larger Pokemon byte blocks. His first item, now containing the value CF, is swapped to item slot 5, where it now sits in a different position inside Pokemon 17's data. Then the third item, which holds the manipulated trainer ID, is put into item slot 13, or the data of Pokemon 18. To complete the puzzle, Mr. Wind reopens the Pokemon party and brings the now precisely aligned bytes into the correct spots. He switches Pokemon 17 with Pokemon 22. This brings the CF byte to the map ID, effectively warping the player into the Hall of Fame. Pokemon 23 is then swapped with Pokemon 18 to align the second half of the trainer ID with its first half and the map script pointer, initiating the credit sequence and completing the run. I'll be playing the video one more time now. See if it makes a little more sense to you this time. Thank you to TI Kevin who helped me with making sure the script was technically accurate. Consider subscribing if you enjoyed this video.